this morning we're going to kick off a If you have a Bible or a smartphone, you can pull, go over to the Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 uh, through 11. Again, this book is over in the New Testament toward uh, the back of your Bibles. And so you turn there right now. Again, my goal today, for us today, is to simply set up some context and the story behind the story we're reading about. That will set up the rest of our series. And I'm also going to take some time just to start off with some background, and then we'll, we'll dig into those first this, this letter. First, about the background letter. Uh, this letter is written around, of course, by Paul, a church in the city of Philippi, uh, a Roman colony in Macedonia. And this was one of the first, very first churches that Paul actually plants. And because, of course, this is the first sermon of the series, uh, I feel obligated to, to have a map, and so hopefully you can see that map well from where you're at. Of course, um, we do have sermon notes in your bulletin where that map is also listed in there, if that's a little bit easier for you to see. But anyways, Philippi is at the top of the map. You can see it with that nice little red arrow right there. It's by the water, so there's a lot of trade, and with that comes a lot of wealth to this city. It's a booming economy. And lots of people from all over the Greco-Roman world travel to this location. And it was places like these, you know, large urban centers that become strategic when the early church first started out. It's these urban cores that there's a ton of influence there and reach made available that for people like Paul, that these were just some of the first places you would just go and plant a church and stick your flag in, in the ground for Jesus because of just the influence that's there at this, this city. Now, what's wild about this is if you're still looking at the map, the early church in Acts chapter 2 started way down in Jerusalem, all the way down where that bottom arrow is in the bottom part of the map. Way down there, you know, Jesus' life and ministry circled around this area, the bottom part of the map, and the end of his ministry, his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension all happened in and around Jerusalem. And Jesus then, at the end of his time here on earth, says to the disciples, go out across the planet, and make disciples. And so the disciples, they get empowered by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And thousands of people come to faith in Jesus. But the thing is, they're all staying in the one spot. They're all staying in Jerusalem at this time. Just clumped there in Jerusalem. And then what happens? Persecution happens. So in Acts chapter 8, the thousands of new Jew, uh, Jesus followers get scattered all across the Mediterranean, and God actually uses this as a means for his people to get out there and make disciples and plant churches in and around the Roman Empire. And then you get to Acts chapter 16, in about 51 AD. And you see Paul and Timothy are traveling around to plant churches and tell people about Jesus, and they arrive finally at the city of Philippi. And they meet a woman there named Lydia, who's a wealthy merchant in the city, and she's a devout follower of Judaism. And Paul and Timothy, they tell her about Jesus, and she becomes the first member, you know, donor, leader of their, their church plant in the city. And they read on further in that chapter, and they meet a slave girl who is said to be possessed and predicts the future, and then she actually comes to faith in Jesus. And so now you get the second member of their core team to start this church. And then, you know, pe people are upset because of this little situation, so they throw Paul and Timothy into jail. And while they're in prison, they share the gospel with a Roman prison guard, and he comes to know Jesus. So you got within a matter of a few days, your th three core team members, a wealthy businesswoman, a formerly possessed slave woman, and a Roman prison guard. Can you imagine what their Sunday school class would have been like? <laughs> You think your class is a little weird? <laughs> you know, they got nothing in common except for Jesus. And their little house church starts to grow and to grow. And Paul eventually leaves there to go to another city to do the same thing. Now fast forward 10 years, like I said, around 61 and 62 AD. Uh, and Paul, he, he's in prison. But this time it's in Rome which is all the way on the other side, on the left side of the map. 
which is, for the record, I know it looks very tiny on the map, but the distance between Jerusalem and where it all began, all this Christianity stuff began to Rome is around 1,400 miles. That's the distance between Maine, from Maine to Florida. So again, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot right there in just a matter of a couple of decades to travel for Christianity. Now, of course, Rome is the capital of the entire empire, and Paul is in trouble once again for telling people about Jesus and planting churches. This sort of thing becomes a common theme in Paul's life. You tell people about Jesus, go to jail for it, get out of jail, tell people about Jesus, repeat. That's just the, the theme in Paul's life. But now in this, this current imprisonment that Paul is experiencing here in Rome, it's more of like a, a house arrest. He's not in a dungeon, he's not getting tortured, and he actually can have visitors come and go, and he actually can, he can communicate via letters. But in this current situation, he doesn't have any of his basic needs met at all. The only way that he can eat each day is if someone from the outside comes to him and gives him what he needs to live. So the Philippian church, they find out about this. And they're thinking, oh no, again, this is not good. This is our guy. This is our pastor. This is the person who gave uh, us his life to start our church through which God has changed our lives. He has sacrificed so much for us to bless us and lead us and shepherd us and teach us that we absolutely need to help and help him and honor him and sacrifice for him during this time of need. And so they become, we, need, we have to make sure that we meet his needs for him. So they decide to all sacrificially give money out of their bank accounts, and they all chip in to collect a bunch of money for him. And they send one of their own guys to go all the way over to Rome to make sure that Paul gets this money so he can have his basic needs met. So now with all this, this background in mind, uh, we get the, the letter of, the, of Philippians. And in a lot of ways, this letter is just a big, big thank you note for their financial generosity. Another big reason why he writes this letter is that he wants to ease whatever anxiety and worry that these people have about him and to say everything's okay and just don't, don't get sidetracked about what you're calling, what your mission is. Don't stop being a church family that's on mission keep getting at it. And so for these four chapters, Paul is communicating this to his old friends in the faith, and actually this, this letter stands out in just a couple different ways. One, that uh, there is no correction at all in this letter. You know, generally most of all of Paul's letters are correcting something that's gone wrong in the church, either theologically or practically. You know, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, you know there was a lot of correction that Paul was doing in that church. There was racial and economic divisions going on in the church. There was a, a guy sleeping around with his mother-in-law. And, you know, Paul's like, hey, c- cut it out. This is not how people of God uh, ought to act. Another example, in the book of Galatians, uh, that's another great example. The whole letter is one big theological correction. He's basically saying, you you guys are believing that you can be saved by good works. No, 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 come on. That is not what it is. You are lived by grace, not by works. But yet this book of Philippians that we'll be studying over the next 12 weeks stands out among all the letters because the tone is so warm and inviting. Every Every verse is bursting with love and care for these people. And so for us reading this same letter 2,000 years later, we get to witness the sort of love and affection that Paul has for these people who he's walked alongside in the faith since the beginning. So that's the first theme is the no correction. The second one is there is joy. There's joy in this letter. Again, it's one of the most joy-soaked books of not just the, the New Testament, but the entirety of the Bible. The word joy, which is chara in the Greek, and rejoicing, which is the derivative of the same Greek word, is repeated some 16 times over the course of four really quick chapters. And 16 times this word joy or joyful is in this book. Some commentators go as far as to say that everything in this book is about joy. Every little letter. And another common theme in this book is that this is the one that, book that has a lot of our favorite coffee mug verses or fine writing here. You know, the ones that are the story of verses people go to, they put on their throw pillows, or they get tattoos of, of course. 
Uh, you know, Philippians 1.21, uh, the idea for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great coffee mug verse. Uh, or how about this one? Again, this is a kid's song that I uh, had for me growing up. You know, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice in Philippians 4.4. 4. And then, of course, Philippians 4.13, I can do it all through him who gives me strength. Of course, this is uh, the team verse for every Christian sports team that's out there, right? <laughs> But seriously, all these verses and so much more are, are pouring out of Paul as he's writing this, this letter to the Philippian church, reminding them to not worry about him, but to keep fighting for the faith together. To keep making Jesus known to your neighbors, no matter what's going on with me, no matter what's going on with you. To keep getting after it because there's so much joy in store just waiting for you to experience. So just for a second this morning, I just want you to think about what's going on here. You know, Paul, you know, Paul is in the prime of his career, so to speak. You know, he's traveling all over, he's planting churches, he's raising up leaders, and now all of a sudden, he's in prison. He's locked up. He's no longer able to get out there and, and plant more churches, do what he feels like God has called him to do. He's isolated from his friends and waiting every single day that somebody might stop in and provide him with what he needs. And he's staring down, also he's staring down potential death, either due to lack of provision or or judgment from Caesar himself. And yet through all this, Paul is filled with joy. Which for the record, I don't know about you, but for me personally, I'm a of that. Encouragement or criticism. What isn't working when what needs to change? And it takes far, far less for me to get worked up and angry or complaining. Like, for example, you know, just let my schedule get interrupted unexpectedly, you know, much less be sent to prison, and boy, do I gripe and I complain. And so this, you know, simply begs the question of how? How is this even remotely possible for for Paul to have this joy? How can he have this, this posture and attitude? How on earth is Paul able to be so joyous in his life? How is it that Paul can be so filled with so much rejoicing? So that that is the the theme of this letter and the question that we will seek to, to answer in this series. And we get part of that answer in the first few verses, so we're gonna read through them together. I encourage you again, pull out your Bibles, Philippians 1 verses 1 through 11 again, if you've gotten there, and we're just gonna read through it bit by bit here, uh, starting off with just the, the first part with verse 1. It says, right at the beginning, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Okay, I just love how Paul opens up this letter. He calls himself a servant, and other translations actually say the word slave. It's almost like he's winking at the Philippian church saying, you know, Jesus is ultimately the one that owns my life and is in charge of my life, not Rome, not Caesar, not the way that Caesar wants them to say the same things about him, that he's supposedly the slave or servant of Caesar. But no, that I am, he's saying, I am a servant of Christ Jesus. And that's the, the tone that he starts off and sets for this whole letter. And then Paul says, moving on to the ver- rest of verse 1 through 3, uh, he says, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. Can you already see here, right off the first couple of verses, the word thank, thanks. And Paul, he is joyful when he thinks about these people. So thankful. So joyful when he thinks about these people. And he goes on in verse 4 and says, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. And there's that word. There's that word joy. All right, kick it off, verse 4. He's got nothing but love for these people. 
Why? Well, we see that here in, in verse 5. Because of your partnership with the gospel from the first day until now. That word partnership here in this verse is the, the Greek word koinia, which is the same word often used to talk about a biblically tight-knit community who is committed to and cares for one another. It's the same word used to describe the closeness that the early church had in, in Acts chapter 2. And he's saying he's so joyful when he thinks about them, not just for the money that they sent, but that they've been on Team Jesus with Paul ever since the first day that he and Timothy landed in Philippi ten years before. And then he moves on to say this in the beginning part of chapter 6. If you have a, a paper Bible in front of you, feel free. If you have a pen, if you're one of those people to underline, I would underline these just couple words here. This is an important part of here. He says, being confident of this. In other words, he's so confident about what he's about to say in these next couple verses that you can take it to the bank. And this is a promise that he's saying over these friends of his here in the rest of this passage, which we'll read here, starting with the second part of verse 6. It says, That he who began a good work in you will, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the, the affection of Christ Jesus. And then move on, verses 9 through 11. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So I just right now I want to move back to focus on uh, verse 6 right here, second part of verse 6. The phrase of he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. This word completion in the, is the Greek word epitaleo. And some translations actually uses the word perfection in its place. The root word there is this word telos. Telos, sorry if I can say it right. And, and in English, I want you to think about it has the, the end goal or the, or the finish line. In other words, Paul is saying that because of their love for one another and for God's mission, that Paul knows in the core of his being that God is working in them and through them and will finish what he has set out to do, no matter what, to bring them into full maturity. And you know what? That's, God, that's God's end game for you as well to transform you into a person who hates sin more and more, who loves Jesus more and more, to be a person who's committed to their church family, to be a person who's committed to Jesus and his people and his mission for the long haul, no matter the consequences or the circumstances, to be a person that at the very end of time will look just like Jesus. And that's what Paul wants for this church. That's what God has promised over them. That's what we want for us as a church, too, that God might finish the work that he has set out to do in us. You know, have you ever started up a task or a project that you never got around to finishing? Or is that just me? <laughs> you know, picking on myself for a bit, you know, I'm a, a dad with a toddler wandering around the house, and there are house projects I want to get to or things I just need to clean. And, and every time I see them, you know, I think you know, shoot, I really need to get that done. I need to get to that one day. <laughs> and I procrastinate and it never gets done. And the reason is, I don't, I don't think the work to be worthy of my time and effort or else I, I would complete it. But that's not how God works. That's not how God is like. He's not forgotten about you. That he didn't start a project and then find something else better to spend his time on. He's invested in it, making sure that you look like the image of his son, Jesus, that he went to the greatest lengths imaginable to make sure it, it would happen. That he is faithful and present in every single moment of your life. And that he is actively using all of your circumstances to work on you, to bring you to completion so that one day that you will look like Jesus 
free from sin and full of life forever and ever. You know, if you just do a, a quick skim of the Bible, you see this over and over again, page by page of Scripture, shouting this starting at page one, even page one of the Bible. In Genesis, we see that he makes the world and everything in it out of an overflow of love and joy and creates humans to specifically enjoy him and all that he made. And our earliest grandparents, of course, they, they mess things up. They sin and they mar God's perfect creation, which brings destruction heartache, and every bad thing into this world. But does that cause God to stop? No, he immediately goes to work. He covers their shame and promises victory over the work of the serpent and moving on to a plan to make right everything that sin had made wrong. Another example, when when God's people were enslaved in a foreign land with suffering and oppression and hopelessness at the hands of an evil and powerful ruler, Pharaoh, Does that cause God to quit, too? Not even close. He rescues them. God walks his people through the sea. He leads them by fire at night. He feeds them bread from heaven, eventually brings them into a land to call their own. And when his people throughout their history, from wandering the desert to the judges and the kings, they forgot him. When they turned their backs on him to go their own way, when they complained and sinned and followed other gods, Did God quit on them? No. He didn't throw in the towel. He didn't give up on his promise to reverse the curse of sin. Rather in love, he rebuked them and through the prophets that called them back to himself and spoke his promises afresh to finish what he started in the very beginning. And then when Jesus, you know, God in the flesh, the one promised to redeem the world was hanging on the cross where he could have easily have said, no, this is not worth it and commanded the nails to leave his hands and feet, and gotten down and walked away. Did he do that, though? Did he quit then? No, he stayed for every excruciating moment until his lips cried out, It is finished. And he walks out of the tomb as a victorious declaration that the kingdom of God is breaking in, and that the day, the day that Paul calls here in this passage, the day of Christ, The day when every enemy, every sin, every bad thing, every result of the serpent's work will be fully and finally eradicated, that that day is coming. Because you know what? Our sin cannot hold God down. Our situations cannot hold God down. If the grace and death itself could not hold God down, then not even Paul's chains can hold down the God of the universe. There is nothing and no one that can stop God. God. And so Paul is so convinced of this down to his bones that he's able, even in a prison cell cell of all places, to say to the Philippians, this is all part of it. You think these chains are any match for God? God's not forgotten about me. God's actually using me right now. Stop him from doing what he set out to do. That he will save people that he will save you. That in the midst of your concern, church, lean on the promise that God is unstoppable. And so this sort of confident, unstoppable joy, as we're going to see in this letter, becomes infectious. More and more people are actually motivated by God, uh, sorry, by Paul's vision of life, that they go out singing with joy to make Jesus known in their lives, in their homes, and in their cities. So my question for us this morning is what if God has that same sort of joy in store for us too? Again, what would happen if you were so like Paul is here? Now you got be in the shadow of death that you that whatever life threw at you, that whether you're suffering right now or whether you're unemployed or whether your marriage is not where you want to be or, or your relationship with kids is not where you want to be, where life is not what you sign up for right now, that, that you modeled this sort of joy-filled perspective that Paul has in his prison cell. What might change in your heart if your perspective changed to be like this? What might happen in your Sunday school classes and in Shippensburg if we were so enamored by this sort of vision? To know that God is on the move in your life even right now. 
And know that God is even using your current circumstances as an opportunity for you to sing even louder your praise to King Jesus who loved you and went to the greatest lengths imaginable for you. And what, what might change if we had the same attitude that Paul had? So as we begin this journey of joy through Philippians, let me just encourage you with this. That God is not done with you today. And God is not done with you today. And there's nothing on earth that can separate you from the promises of God, whether that be unemployment or singleness or separation or divorce or a missed opportunity or whatever. That God is for you and is working everything in your life to give you more of himself and shape you into the person and the image of Jesus that you were meant to be. So hear me, again, God is not done in your marriage. Again, you might feel like you are, but God is not. Again, God is not done with your kids. God is not done with your struggle or the pain that you are experiencing right now in your life. Again, most of all, that God is not done with you. So that's where we're going with this series. That we, we want to have this vision for our lives and for one another that's brimming over the edge with hope and joy and with what God is doing in our midst. You know, after the last few years that we've had, you know, in the spike in mental health and screen addiction and loneliness, again, what if we use this moment that we are in in 2022 as an opportunity to be unique, compelling, again, just a beautiful counter-narrative to the world around us? where we know that God is at work in every single moment and to choose joy, to choose good, to, to choose the true and the beautiful in this world. Now, I, I know for many of us, to be those kinds of people, it's not as simple as just flipping a switch. To be these kinds of people is something is to cultivate in our lives. It's probably not going to come naturally or, or easy to us. So something we want to invite you to do over these next three months as we get through this series is the, the practice biblical gratitude together. And the practice biblical gratitude together as a church family. And maybe you never thought of gratitude as a practice, but, but here is what it is. Biblical gratitude is recognizing and expressing thanks for what Jesus is actively doing in us and through us. Okay, let me say it again. I know it's on our screens, but I'll say it again. Biblical gratitude is recognizing and expressing thanks for what Jesus is actively doing in us and through us. So that we can be people like Paul, who even in the midst of less than ideal circumstances can choose joy and give thanks to God, knowing that he's using whatever is coming at us to make him known in and through us. For us to practice biblical gratitude together, we'll be walking through some specific ways for us to cho choose joy, to see God at work in our lives, to choose to see how him on the move in our lives and the lives around us. And it's my hope that by doing this consistently, it might have the, the net effect to take root in our lives so that we may lift our eyes to Jesus and choose to fix our eyes on the joy that we have found in him. So here's what I want us to start doing this week, and I even encourage you to do this all throughout this series. The first thing is to list out each day what you are grateful to God for. You can first set aside a time and a place each day and take just a few min min sorry, minutes listing out what you're thankful to Jesus for. So maybe you have a, a gratitude journal by your nightstand that, so that either when you wake up or before you go to bed, you spend some time listing out those things. Or you can use an app on your phone to keep a list of those things on it as well. By having a record of these things, when times get difficult, you can go back to that list and see all the ways that God has provided for you and blessed you. You know, also, learning to fight for joy means fighting to be thankful in the moments that are less ideal too. Knowing that no matter the circumstances, that God loves you and sees you and is, even, is using even the hardest moments in your life so that you can look more and more like Jesus. So even as you list out the positive things that you're thankful for, thank God for the hard moments too. Knowing that our God is good and faithful and at work in the, your life no matter what. 
So that's the first thing to do. The second thing is just to write out gratitude verses and place them throughout your home as a, just a, a visual cue to lift your eyes up and thank Jesus. So again, put, put it on a post-it note or index card. You can write uh, some of the verses I listed down on the screen or even in your notes. Or you can pick others and just place it in a prominent place in your house or your office or your car. That way, when you see it, it becomes your cue in that moment to just meditate on those passages and give thanks to God throughout your day. And then finally, share it with others. Share th- these things with others. As followers of Jesus, we don't follow him on our own, but we share our joy with other people. So as you work through these practices, talk about what you're thankful for ongoingly with the people in your life. Tell our people on a daily basis what you're grateful for. Tell your Sunday school class, either when you meet on Sundays or even call, email, or text during the week. Tell your family and friends, uh, your spouse, uh, again, even email me. <laughs> uh, my email address is actually in the bulletin. I would love to see these different responses. Feel free to even email, email me, sorry, feel free to email me even every single day. That doesn't bug me at all if you send me those things. Again, telling others will not only help to cultivate this joy in your life, but it'll also grow within your different communities that you are a part of it. That scripture says that when we share our joy, our joy increases. And also when we practice gratitude more and more, the scriptures tell us that we fight anxiety, that we push back apathy, that we multiply our joy, and in the process, the Spirit uses our gratitude to look more and more like Jesus. So that, that is my hope for these next few months, that we would be a people of joy, that who know God is at work in us and through us and will not be stopped no matter what is going on. It begins in many ways by just cultivating this posture of gratitude. And it is our hope that if we leverage this and turn gratitude into a habit, that the fruit of it would look a lot like what we see in the Philippian church. That our family would be loved, that God's name would spread throughout our city, and that we would see his kingdom expand throughout Shippensburg and beyond. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for your blessings in our life, our lives, and for your servant Paul. We praise you, Lord, for Paul's wisdom and for his works through the, through the scripture. And we ask you, Lord, to inspire us to use this book in our lives as we grow in you through the teachings of Paul. Lord, we ask you to, to strengthen us each day as we endure through battles. Allow us to praise and love each other through faith in you, Jesus. You can shield us from evil through truth, the gospel, salvation, and prayer. Guide us to abide by your word as we spread the gospel to, to all becoming examples of faith and gratitude. God, we pray that you could, will continue to bless us, to bless our lives, and fill us with joy. We ask you, Lord, to guide our footsteps and lead us to the way everlasting. That through faith in you, Lord, we seek salvation and a place with you in heaven. According to your word, your everlasting wisdom and strength, may your will be done in our lives and for our life. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.